Now, we're going to need a Bible now. So, especially the children need to be able to see a Bible. You got a Bible? Got a Bible. Great. I want to just talk to you a little bit about this word, the word no. Not N O, but K N O W. Ali here is learning English, right? We, have, we mean so many different things when we say no. We mean no as in stop. We mean no as in no. Think about it. You know, we know things. Right, so there are different things here on the screen that we're going to say that we know about. And I want you to tell me what they are and what it means to know them. Okay? And that they might even move these images. Look at that. Wow. What's that representing? <coughs> yes, Jeremiah. Calculating. Yeah. I'm looking for a word beginning with m and ending Ma in ass. <laughs> Not to give anything away. <laughs> Sums. Sums. Ah, oh, it's so close, Ray. <laughs> Kerry J, Ma come on. Maths. Do you know math? You're right. Maths. We know maths. When we say we know maths, what do we mean? Okay. So if I say you know maths, so you know like one add one equals eleven. eleven. <laughs> you're supposed to the adults then you're supposed to help me, <laughs> not make it more difficult for me. So when I say one add one equations. Jeremiah, come on. Two. Oh Dan. Your mum gave you some help there because she had no, so little confidence. Right. Why one equals two? We know that because we know things add up and make certain things. Yeah? So we know how numbers work in our heads. Yeah? Now, what about this? What do you think this is representing? We might know this in a slightly different way to we know maths. What's, what's going on on the screen there? Jeremiah. Time. What's it doing? It's going which way? <coughs> Going backwards, yeah? What, so what's this supposed to be representing? History. Yes, well done, Lucy. It's representing history. So you've got the slides in front of you. But that's okay, you're helping me. When we say we know history, what do we mean by knowing history? So we know some, some what? We know some... Things that have passed, thanks Alice, Th things that have happened in the past, some events that have happened in the past. I'm not going to test you because my history is not great either. So, you know, I, you could tell me what happened in 1066, couldn't you? Anyway, maybe you could. What about this? Next thing. So we, we know maths, we know history. What do we think this represents? They're all high-fiving each other. A group of people high-fiving each other. Jeremiah, I'm so glad you're here, Jeremiah. Friendship. That is brilliant. That's exactly right. When we say we know friends, do we know friends like the way we know maths and the way that we know history? What do we mean when we know friends? When you say you know friends. Not you have no friends, but you know friends. As in K-N-O-W. What do we mean? What sort of thing do we mean by knowing friends? Well, you're a miserable lot, aren't you? None of you have got any friends. We, thanks, Rebecca. We know what they like and what they don't like. We know things about them. But we, when we say we know them, it means we have a relationship with them, don't we? We, we live our lives together. We, we rub shoulders with one another. We maybe share accommodation together. There, there may be friends in our in our family, who we, we live in the same house as, and we, we get to share our lives together, we eat together. We know them in a different way to we know maths and history because it's a relationship, okay? Now then, in your Bibles, turn to page 1173, Ephesians chapter one, verse 17. <coughs> Ephesians chapter one and verse 17. Let me read it to you, and then I want you to tell me what Paul means in Ephesians chapter 1 by knowing God. 
Okay, Paul is praying for the Ephesians and he says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. So that you may know him, that's know God better. Let me read it to you again. I keep asking that God, sorry, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. What does Paul think knowing God is like? Does he think it's like maths, history, or friendship? Put your hand up if you think it's knowing God like maths, like we just know, you know, God is a triune God, so he's Father, Son, and Spirit. We just know a few things like that. Hand up if you think that's what he means by knowing God. This is good. Yeah. What if you think it's like knowing history, where we know just the facts of what God has done in the past? You know, God led the people of Israel out of Egypt through the Red Sea, brought them into the promised land. Is that what he means by knowing God? It's not, is it? He means knowing God like friendship, doesn't he? When he says knowing God, he means we know God like we know friends. We have a relationship with God. That's what he means, isn't it? Listen, if you're a Christian this morning, being a Christian is about living in a relationship with God where you get to know him better and better. And that's what we're going to be thinking about uh, in our sermon together this morning. So children, thanks for your help this morning. You guys, so if you're in primary school, you're going to head out to Sunday school after I've prayed for you. And then the rest of us are going to stay together and listen to the sermon. And Liz is taking out <coughs> Sunday school this morning. So let's pray and let's pray for the Lord's help this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you that it's possible because of what Jesus has done for us to know you. Not just know a few things about you, not even just know the history of what you've done, but to know you like we know our friends, like we have friendships and relationships. And we pray this morning that you might help the children as they go to Sunday school to learn more about knowing you, that they might know you, Heavenly Father, as as their Lord and their Saviour. And we pray for us as we listen to the sermon that we might be able to think some more about that and that you might deepen our love for you and our trust in you, we ask. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So on the inside of your notice sheet is an outline of the sermon, which you might want to follow along with. And Vanessa is going to come and read God's word for us. So we're going to be reading from Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15 down to verse 23. Now, Vanessa's going to read, and then we'll look at it together. Vanessa. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Great, thank you, Vanessa. Well, if you keep that passage open, that will help you as we uh, follow along. And um, like I said, there's there's an outline in the inside of the notice sheet. And if you want a pen, um, well, actually, I've got some pens here so you can... One, uh, there are a number of surprises, I think, in the book of Ephesians. So I don't know whether you've noticed these as we've been going through the book of Ephesians. 
One, I think, surprise in the book of Ephesians is the, is the lack of punctuation. You know, the Apostle Paul would not pass GCSE English. His failure to use any full stops all the way from verse 3, all the way down uh, to verse 14. The sentences are way too long. The other surprise, I think, when you turn to the book of Ephesians is you realize it's a letter written to the church in Ephesus from Paul, but really for the first two chapters... Paul doesn't really talk to the Ephesians at all. Sorry, for the first chapter, he doesn't really talk to the Ephesians at all. He talks to God about the Ephesians. And that's a surprise, isn't it? When you write a letter to someone, you start saying things to them. But there's another surprise that I want us to think about this morning, and that is what Paul prays for here in Ephesians 1. Look down with me at the passage and just follow the logic with me, and I'll try and show you this surprise. Look at verse 15. He says, for this reason and the reason is then what follows the reason is because he's heard about the ephesians faith in the lord jesus and their love for all god's people you know paul has heard uh, the ephesians christian the ephesians are christians and that makes paul pray verse 16. in fact he's not stopped praying giving thanks for them and verse 17 he says i keep asking and what is it that he is asking for the ephesian church look at verse 17. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, what? May give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Now that's the surprise. Paul is praying that God, the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, may give the Ephesians the spirit, the Holy Spirit of wisdom and revelation. When? Only a few verses before, in verse 13, if you look at verse 13, Paul has said that the Ephesian church already have the spirits because the spirit has been given as a seal or a deposit guaranteeing their inheritance when jesus returns let me just try and spell out this shock for us or this surprise paul is asking god over and over keeps asking that the ephesian church will be given what they've already got you think about that be like us praying over and over and over again that that we would be a church in kilburn but we are already a church in Kilburn. So why would we keep praying for that? It'd be like us keeping praying that Ray would be an architect when he's already an architect, or asking God over and over that he'd give Jeff a sense of humor when we know that Jeff already has a sense of humor. Why would we keep asking for God to give him one? But asking God to give the Ephesians the spirit is effectively asking God over and over and over to do what he's already done. Why? Why? Well, that's what I want us to think about uh, this morning. Why Paul prays like that? Why Paul asks and asks God to give what has already been given? Now, I want to suggest to you that the way the passage works this morning is that this essentially is a single topic prayer in all of those verses that we've read. So verse 16 introduces this not stopping prayer. Then verse 17 tells us that Paul keeps asking. Verse 18, if you look down at that, starts with, I pray. And what Paul is keeping asking in verse 17 is given further detail and clarity from verse 18 when he expands on it. But really, it's the same point all the way through the passage, which means, which is good for us this morning, that this is a one point sermon. Okay, there's only one point for us this morning with two sub points, but one main point. And then he's going to expand on it further. So what is the one point? This is why Paul is praying over and over that they might have the spirit whom they already have. This is the point, because we need more of the spirit to know more of God. We need more of the spirit to know more of God. Look again at verse 17, and I'll read it to you again. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. The important words there to notice are the words, so that... Paul is praying that God, the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, might give them the spirit of wisdom and revelation in order that, so that they might know God. Not because they're completely ignorant of him. Of course, they're not. In an important sense, the church know God already. They've heard about him. We were thinking last week how they've listened to the gospel message. They have believed it. But rather, Paul's point is that the Christian life is essentially described as a progressive getting to know God better and better, more and more. So while the Christian life starts decisively with conversion, that that point where in the words of verse 13, we hear the message of the gospel and believe, still as a Christian, 
the Christian life is a lived out relationship of getting to know God better and better. You know, like a husband and a wife get to know each other over the years. They get to understand one another's uh, foibles more and more. Or friends, as they live with one another through the ups and downs of life, get to know each other better. So the Christian who is already themselves fully known by God, God knows us already fully, isn't he? He knows us better than we know ourselves. Yet we live our lives getting to know God better and better. Now, as we were thinking with the children, this, this word know is not just knowing facts, is it? It's not actually that Christian life is that you and I need to learn more facts about God. Facts about God will help us. But being a Christian is more than just learning facts about God. It's a relational knowledge. It's a recognizing who God is and what he's done. It's an understanding of his involvement in our lives in every moment of every day. Knowing in the Bible is a really, really intimate relational word. It is used of the most intimate parts of marriage. Now, let's just press into this a little bit more, because I think this is revolutionary to how we understand our Christian lives. If you're a Christian this morning, if you have heard the gospel, believed the gospel, trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, been sealed by the Spirit, to use Paul's language here, then Paul's assumption is that your biggest need, your most urgent prayer request, if you like, the thing that should be at the top of your prayer list, or the first thing that you say to others when they say, how can I pray for you? It's not a request for a blessed life or for even an easy life. It's not even, and I think this is astounding, it's not even a prayer for personal holiness. Rather, your most urgent need, my most urgent prayer need, is for a spirit-enabled, deeper, richer knowledge of God that recognizes him and sees him and experiences him in every moment of every day. Let me, let me try and put it the other way around in a negative, just so that we can see the emphasis. Paul thinks this, that the great danger in front of the Ephesian church, the great danger which is in front of you and I as well this morning, is that we might live our Christian lives with an impoverished, half-baked, watered-down, unlived experience of knowing God. That we can, in one sense, be saved by him, but in a in a way, be ignorant of him in this relational sense. Now, we need to be really careful here that we don't make a theological error. Paul is not saying here that there's some secondary experience of the spirit that comes after conversion. He's not saying, oh, get converted, and then what really matters is an experience afterwards where you're able to pray in other languages or see visions. It's not that. Paul is really clear that Christians have the spirit already. The point is not that we don't have the spirit, but rather that we don't yield to him. We don't walk with him. We don't allow him the influence in our lives that he longs to have. We, don't, we keep ourselves from the riches of the knowledge of God that can be ours through him. And so Paul keeps asking, has not stopped asking, praying that God would give them more and more and more and more of the spirit that they already have. Let's just try and think about how this might apply to us as a church this morning. It feels very much like we're entering a new season in church life, doesn't it? We are trying to put past hurts and disappointments behind us. We're pressing on together. But here is what we need. This is what we need as a church. We don't need a new program. Okay? We, we don't need new songs. We don't need a new pastor. We don't need people to finally listen to those ideas that we've been suggesting for years and years and everyone's been ignoring. Why have they been ignoring me? No, what we need, says Paul, is more of the spirit so we can know more of God. That's what we need. That's what we need. That's what we should be praying for, that we together might know God's work amongst us, that every church member here might know that they haven't gone for a moment this week without being in the presence of a God who loves them, who sent his son to save them, who indwells them by his spirit. We need to know that there's not a suffering that we face, a, a trouble that we have, a, a sin that we fight that's not eclipsed by the glorious hope of the gospel and the presence of God in our lives. Now, perhaps this morning you're not a Christian or you're not sure whether you are. and It's brilliant that you're here. And, and I imagine, I don't know, but I imagine that if that's you this morning, you're, you're possibly thinking something like this. You know, this all sounds just a bit crazy, doesn't it? I, I, you know, I knew that Christians thought God existed and, 
And that seems a little outlandish to me, but now it seems as if you're saying to me that you're expecting me to believe that it is possible for people today to have an experience of God that's so glorious and wonderful, so close to them even, that it overshadows grief and sickness and, and betrayal and rape and sin and suffering. And I want to say to you, if that's what you're thinking as a non-Christian this morning, you're exactly right, that's what I'm saying. You're exactly right. And it's wonderful. And so I must ask you this morning, have you experienced this? Have you met the Lord like this? Do you know this? Do you know what it is to recognize him, to see his hand at work, to sense his presence and know that he's with you, to cry tears of pain with joy in your heart, knowing that you're not lost or abandoned, but even in those moments are knowing God? Do you know what it is to have a thirst for him that you cannot quench? to love him, to long for his presence. Well, the truth is none of us have enough of that, do we? So what do we do? We keep asking, we keep praying, because our biggest need is that we have more of the spirit to know more of God. Let, let me just say this as an aside here, it's sort of out of the flow a little bit, but let me say it's your pastor here, this is what I long for you to pray for me. I think the longer I've done pastoral ministry, the more I've realized that there are lots of challenges in leading a church and I will make lots of mistakes and get things wrong. But what I long for you to pray for me more than getting all the decisions right and not making any mistakes, what I want you to pray for me is that I would have more of the spirit to know more of the father through the work of the son. That's what I'd long for you to pray for me because that's what I really need. And if you're a member of the church here, I want you to know that's what I'm praying for you every week, I long that for you and for me. I said a few moments ago, this is really a one point sermon. That's the one point. So if you've, if you've got that, you can zone out and start scrolling your phone for something else if you like. But Paul does expand on it a bit and he makes two essentially sub points where he, he confronts what might be barriers to us knowing God more or to us experiencing this work of the spirit. And so let's just look at those as we finish. I'll frame them as objections because I think that'll make them stick in our minds a bit better. The first barrier is this. Isn't life a bit hopeless? Isn't life a bit hopeless? I don't know whether you feel this, but the truth is that life can be a bit disappointing. Our Christian lives themselves can be a bit disappointing. You know, it's all very well, isn't it, us talking here, and we can get ourselves excited in this room, can't we, about knowing more of God. You know, we can say together how we want to know God in every circumstance. We want more of him. But then as soon as you leave this building, or, or maybe even before you leave this building, reality bites, yeah? And we, we sense that sense of disappointment that our Christian lives don't quite live up to that experience. Or even some of the other things that we hope might happen in our lives don't happen. Perhaps you long to marry and you never get married, or perhaps you, you long to marry, you do get married, and marriage itself turns out not to be what you hoped. Maybe you'd love to have children, but you can't have children. Or maybe you do have children and they don't work out as you hoped. Perhaps you long to get a job and you get a job and then you lose it or that turns out to dis disappoint you. Perhaps you buy a flat and it gets taken away from you. Perhaps you save money for retirement, you get there and it's gone. Maybe we, we eat carefully but end up unhealthy anyway. Our bodies don't quite function as we hoped they would. And we're tempted to think, aren't we, all this more of the spirit to know more of God, it's all very well, but life itself is just fundamentally very disappointing. God, if you're here with me, why are my hopes dashed all the time? Why is my life just a collection of shattered dreams? I mean, what's the point in being a Christian if my life is working out no better than my non-Christian friends? Well, that's the objection that Paul picks up in verse 18. Let me read it to you again. Look at verse 18. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. Here the prayer starts, isn't it? Very much the same as in verse 17. Praying for the eyes of our hearts to be enlightened is essentially the same as praying for a spirit of wisdom and revelation. It's the same thing. But Paul here lands it more specifically, not just in a general knowledge of God, but in a specific knowledge of the hope to which God has called us, the riches of his glorious inheritance and his holy people. Now listen, there's complexity here, but let me just try and show you what is super plain. In the illuminating work of the spirit in the life of the Christian, knowing God, this knowing God that Paul has been praying about, is seen how? in a growing hope for what 
God is doing in the universe, not what I'm longing for in my life. In other words, Paul says, listen, this will work out by the fact that you will begin to realize that God has called us to something richer, more glorious than a happy marriage, a successful career, beautifully behaved children, a a successful financial profile. He's called us instead to share in the riches of glory as his holy people, to belong to him, to be with him in a world remade by his power, living in a city where the streets are literally paved with gold and the light of the glory of God shines 24 seven, where there's no more pain or sickness or suffering and we're with the Lord. Now just put this together with me for a moment. This means for our one point, yeah? Knowing God, more of the spirit to know more of God. Knowing God like that is seen in a shift in what we're hoping for. You will know if this prayer of verse 16, 17 and 18 is being answered because you will find in your heart that there's a subtle change in what you want for your life, what you're longing for. You know, what you'll find is that that promotion that you really wanted turns out not to be that important anymore to you. You'll realize that your your failing health isn't driving you to despair quite as much as you thought it might do. That the devastation of divorce doesn't seem quite as disastrous as it did before. Why? Well, because by the Spirit, you know more of God and are hoping more for the things that God is doing than the things that you long for. I think we can apply this to us corporately as well. We we might hope for many things for our church. You know, I hope in time we can maybe redecorate this building, cover over the yellow, right? I hope that we can purchase the freehold. I hope that people keep coming. But, but really, we will, know, we will know when God is at work amongst us, when more than those things, what we hope for is for people here to persevere until Jesus comes back. That we hope for sinners who are lost to be saved. That we hope for Jesus' return, not to redecorate this building, but to refine it with fire. That will be quite a sight, won't it? Imagine. Come, Lord Jesus. The second and maybe even bigger barrier to us knowing God and growing in our knowledge of God is the problem of our sin. So maybe our hopes have been dashed, but the second thing is, aren't we just a bit too sinful? I think a moment of honesty might help us see that this is true. All this talk of the glory of God, of knowing him in every moment of every day, of of feeling his presence with us as we're standing washing up or as we are chatting to a friend or as we're walking for the bus. It's all great, isn't it? But it leaves me with this massive problem that I know you know we're just not good enough, are we? We're not good enough. We're not good enough for that. There are dark corners in our hearts, in my heart, in your heart, that we we fear the shining light of the glory of God in, don't we? There are things that I've done. There are places that I go. There are things that I say that I'm I know God can't give me more of him. Well, what does Paul say to that? It's covered, I think, at the uh, beginning of verse 19. Let me read it to you again. It sort of picks it up in the middle of a sentence, but that's okay. And his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be the head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Now, I think if if over these weeks and months we really grasp the book of Ephesians, it will blow our minds, okay? This is one of those mind-blowing moments. Just think about what Paul is saying. This is how this growing knowledge of God works out in relation to our sin and the work of the devil. A growing understanding of God comes along with it, a growing understanding that the power at work within us is nothing short of the resurrecting power of Jesus. The great might in verse 20 that raised Jesus from the dead, that great power, verse 21, that has seated him far above, not slightly above, but far above all rule and authority, the the name that which every other power quivers, where all things will be under his feet, 
That power is ours by the Spirit. Did you notice that? Because the Spirit of verse 17 is the power of verse 19. Sin crushing, death defeating, Satan slaying power at work in us through Jesus Christ by the Spirit from the Father. As Jesus himself is powerfully exalted for the church. For the church. So, application, don't worry. Don't worry. This growing knowledge of God is not something that our sin can defeat. All the sins of others, all the work of the devil himself, not even death can destroy this work. Imagine it like, a, like an advert for a pair of trainers, okay? You know how it goes, don't you? There's a video of a famous athlete running around a track in a pair of trainers. And at the end of the advert, it kind of zooms in on the trainers and goes, you know, effectively, the message is something like this. Buy these trainers and you'll run like that. Now, just to let you into a secret, it doesn't work. Okay? You buy the trainers and you won't run like that. Why won't you run like that? Because really what you need is the legs, not the trainers. Yeah. But the advert is suggesting to you that you can have the power by having the trainers. Now, in a sense, that's what's going on in these verses. But it's not false advertising in these verses. It's a full close-up not of Jesus running around an athletics track, but of Jesus smashing the grave. It's a close-up of Jesus defeating sin, of defeating death, of, uh, of subduing the forces of evil, of Jesus being seated in glory with everything under his feet, filling everything in every way. And then, then Paul says, he kind of zooms in, doesn't he? Not on Jesus' open-toed sandals saying, here, have a pair of those. No, not that, but saying, listen, the spirit that was at work in the Lord Jesus is now at work in you. It's now at work in you. All fear is gone. Because the Lord Jesus, the power that was at work in the Lord Jesus is at work in us. Again, just let, let's land this for us practically. It means, doesn't it, for us as a church, for you and I as individuals this morning, what we need to remember, what we must remember, is that there is nothing that we have done there is no place that we have gone, there's no trauma that we've experienced, there's no sin that we've committed that can defeat the power of God to give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation that we might know him better. Our sin, as bad as our sin might be, is not strong enough to defeat the power at work within us. The devil, as cunning as he might be, is not strong enough to defeat the power at work within us. Because death-defeating, Christ-exalting power is ours by the Spirit who dwells in us. And so what do we do? Well, there's only one point, isn't there? We keep asking, we keep praying that God might give us the Spirit of wisdom and revelation so that we might know him better. Well, let's take a few moments now in quiet just to echo that prayer of Paul's in our hearts. And I'll pray for us. Heavenly Father, we keep asking that you, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, might give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that we may know you better and better. We pray that the eyes of our hearts may be enlightened, that we might know more richly and more fully the glorious riches of the hope to which you've called us. That we might know your incomparably great power that's at work for us who believe. That power which brought Jesus from the dead, seated him at your right hand in the heavenly realms, far above any other rule or authority or power and dominion, and every name that's invoked, not just now, but forever and ever and ever. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that the Lord Jesus has everything under his feet 
that he rules over everything for us who are his body, the fullness of him who fills us in every way. Oh, these truths are mind-blowing, but imprint them on our hearts, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.